My name is Jim Fleming, and this is Our Sunday School. Our Sunday School is part of Stewart Heights Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. To prepare for this lesson, please go to OurSundaySchool.com for a copy of today's handout. Now, let's get to this week's lesson. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Our Sunday School. If you've got your Bibles, we're in Philippians chapter 3 for a little bit longer, but not much longer. So we're coming in the home stretch on chapter 3 there. So uh, if you've got your green books, we're on page 66 today. And uh, I have, while you're turning there, I have made a decision on the uh, next book of the Bible that we're going to be doing. So does anybody have their Bible open to Philippians? Has anybody got their Bible open to Philippians? If you turn the page after Philippians, what's next? Colossians. Colossians it is. So we're just going to keep going right on down the road. Now, uh, does anybody ever remember us doing Colossians before in our Sunday school? You do? Awesome. Yes, we did Colossians in 2015, but we only spent 18 weeks there. It's like just this high-level brushing of the text and the concepts here, right? So, uh, yeah, so, so provided I get the thumbs up from the publisher uh, that we use the material for in the books, uh, specifically the Greek text, uh, then we're good to go with Colossians. She, this is all based out of Germany, and in Germany they go on vacations for like a month at a time. So she gets back from vacation in a week and a half, and then we'll have an answer. So there's that. So if y'all want something to be praying about, that'd be great uh, that we got a thumbs up on that. All right, so if you're at Philippians chapter 3, we'll read through Philippians chapter 3 in the first verse of chapter 4, uh, and then we'll begin today on page 66 with verse 18. Philippians 3. In addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I've already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have also been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. There are very few pieces of scripture that are more fun to read than Philippians. I will tell you. It is just, you, 
Zeke, can you tell I like reading that text? Like it, it is just so enjoyable to read the text here. Um, I was reading through Isaiah a couple of months ago, and I did not have that same emotional response. So <laughs> nothing against the old T prophets, but, uh, you know, it's just different. It's just different. So let's start with uh, verse 18 on page 66 in your green books. If you need a green book, it's at OurSundaySchool.com. One's available for download there. Uh, so we begin verse 18 with what word? For, which is a connecting word to the prior section. So we're assigning a reason. So this is Paul explaining what came before. So what came before was this exampling. So we saw the, the prior example, the good example, uh, the example in us, right? So who's the us here? I didn't go back to read chapter 1, but who's the us? Paul in. Who's almost always with Paul? Timothy. Timothy, there you go. It's a good guess. If you're ever not sure, like, who's hanging out with Paul? It's probably Timothy. Probably Timothy. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Epaphroditus is there a little bit, and then he goes, and he goes, goes back, and he goes, and he's got the, you know. Epaphroditus is the runner. Um, yeah, so, so four, so I have often told you. So have we mentioned uh, that the concept of repetition is good in this class? In Philippians, yes. Well, that's our first application, is repetition is good. And this is not just, I've told you once before. This word told is in the imperfect tense. So this is continuous ongoing action usually in the past. So when he says, I've often told you before, it, you could almost translate this, I've told you many times repeatedly. Um, so it wasn't just, I touched on this once and said it once then. It's like, no, 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 no. I told you multiple times, multiple times. Does this make sense? So if you, if you need a modern framework, I'll just say little children, right? So multiple times, multiple times. Like this is kind of his, where he's headed here. So what do we, what do, we do with that? What's the, what's the personalization? Well, I got two personalizations from this one. Uh, so 1A for me is repeat the important because there's stuff that's important that we need to have repeated and it's really, really good. Right? Uh, my good friend Bill Brandenburg uh, tells me he loves to hear a sermon preached twice because he needs it. <laughs> uh, he forgets or he's just rebellious or sinful and we just need it more often. Uh, so for those of us that are in speaking positions, repeat the importance, uh, repeat the important, and then 1B is receive the repetition. For those of us that are in the receiving end of this. So repeat the important and re receive the repetition. That's way too many R's. Sorry, I'm not trying to alliterate here. <laughs> My new favorite thing, just to mess with Daryl, is to give an outline where everything's alliterated but one point. Amen. And I don't mean like Gary spell in future with PH. I mean, like, it's not the same letter of the alphabet. Uh, so, this is how mathematicians rebel. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what do you do with that, right? All right, so verse 18. So, for I have often told you, and now say, this is a present active, so he's repeatedly saying it now, again, with tears. Now, somebody tell me what the definition of that word tears is there in your green book. To sob or to wail aloud. I'm, tears is, it's fine. It's fine. But it doesn't adequately encapsulate the full emotional range of like where this word is going to. This is a lot. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a, I don't think I try to do this often. I try not to do this very often at all. But I can almost see Paul, you know, talking to the amanuensis who's writing down his words and tears are coming down his face while he's saying these words, right? If Paul were the one writing, which he basically almost never did, uh, you could see that, like, the tears on the page itself. Like, this is, this is breaking his heart because it's so terribly sad. Now, we're going to come back for some application and personalizations, but what's the message that's so sad is that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Like, that's the, that's the heartbreaking... <sighs> it 
it's, it's just heartbreaking, right? So application here at the bottom of page 67, some messages are sad, right? Some messages are heartbreaking. Some messages drive us to tears. We've had, a, we've had an unusual amount of death this year with people associated with our class. Uh, and that's heartbreaking, right? But it's a different kind of heartbreaking when, when those deaths are from folks who have lived as enemies of the cross of Christ, right? It's different. So some messages are sad. And I, to this I would say, uh, personalization 1A for me is to say them. Like just because the message is sad doesn't mean we filter the message. We still say the message, right? There is some news that needs to be communicated that is just sad. It's heartbreaking. And we've got to say it. And then when we're on the receiving end of it, 1B for me is hear them, hear these messages. We are, we are very, very quick in our current culture to bounce off of anything sad. We want to get to the happy, to the positive, to the spin, to the good, to the great, to the make me smile, to the make me laugh. And, and you can actually watch this. Uh, if you go back, I watch a lot of movies. If you go back and watch movies from the 50s and 60s and 70s, they will hang out in sadness much longer. Today, it's a couple of seconds at most, three seconds, and anything more than that, and you can feel, like in a movie theater, the whole audience just, like, you got to get us out of this, you got to get us out of this, you got to get us out of this, because collectively as a culture, we don't do sad anymore. We don't mourn. Certainly not over spiritual things, right? So, so now, I say again, wailing, with sobbing, that many, page 68, live. And this is a present active. So this would have been people who are alive while Paul was having these words written down. Right then, they live. And, and this word is used in Philippians 3.17. And in 3.17, Paul is calling the Philippians. He says, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live, same word, according to the example you have in us, which is a good example. So Paul here, once again, he's doing this compare contrast. So we get our contrast here. These are as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, Paul doesn't dial in to, to what specifically he's talking about, but we know from his expansion and explanation in verse 19, when he says their end is destruction, does that sound like a believer? No. So he, I, I don't think contextually he is speaking about believers who've lost their way or lost their minds for just a minute. And they're, no, 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 no. When he runs their story out to its natural conclusion, their end is destruction. Right? It, this, is, this is somebody who's not, who does not say Jesus is Lord. So these are the enemies as of the cross of Christ. How many enemies are there? Many. Many. He says that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. How many examples has Paul given to the Philippians so far? Let's list them real quick. Who's, who's the first and best example Paul's given? Our Sunday school answer? Jesus. That's right, our Lord Jesus Christ, first and best. Second example Paul references several times in Philippians? Paul, right? Another example Paul references in Philippians? Timothy and Epaphroditus. That's exactly right. You got them both. Excellent. That's exactly right. Yeah, so he's, he's given a, a few good examples, right? He didn't say, many follow after Christ and are do... No, 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 no. This is... That, that's not the way this math works. And I think this is in part of what's breaking Paul's heart, is that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Think about what Paul has personally gone through in his life to share and spread the gospel. And he sees people say no. And not just say no, but 
violently say no. And it's just heartbreaking. So one application here I think we see if we just slow down and look at the text a little. Bottom of page 68 is enemies outnumber good examples. Enemies outnumber good examples. So what do we do with that? So if enemies outnumber good examples, I would say we imitate the good, right? The numbers may not be in our favor right now, but history will be. Like, when all of history is written and is done, and we turn and look back on what God has done and how he has applied redemption to the history of the world, we will go, whoa. Like, this is unbelievable. So, imitate the good, and then I've got 1B, mourn the enemies. Mourn the enemies. Now, what Paul did not say here, he did not say scorn the enemies. He did not say ridicule the enemies. He did not say mock the enemies. He's mourning them. You see the difference? I'm going to read something real quick. So, we learn much about someone by how he treats his enemies. So what did Jesus Christ do with his enemies? He loved them, and then he laid his life down for them. What does Satan do with his enemies? He destroys, right? He wants to mar the image of God. So which, which way are we going with our enemies? And are they our enemies? Whose enemies are they? Of the cross of Christ, right? Paul didn't make the enemies personal, even though if there was anybody in the history of Christianity who had the right to go make the enemies and the enemies' attacks personal, good grief, like... I think he actually died along the way at least once. Like, I'm, the text really looks like he died. Like, that's a, that's a lot. Dave. Yes, good. So we're going to zoom the lens out, right? Yeah, Good. Exactly. Because you start in verse 15, therefore let all of you who are mature think this way. And yep. If you think differently about anything, God will reveal this to you also. Yep. And then we just dealt with, you know, that we imitate the good, we mourn our enemies and so forth. And this is what Paul is communicating to the Philippians. This is the way you operate in a world that is contrary your biblical worldview, That's right. your view of Christ, yep. or your following after Christ. Yep. It, this is epically different than what we see in the church today. Bad. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it couldn't be any more different that we're skewering anyone who has an ultimate lifestyle. We are, you know, just lambasting each other if we have even a minute adjustment in the way that we see things and, and so forth. <laughs> And, 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 I mean, this is a condemnation on, on our modern evangelical church. Who do you write this to? The, his modern evangelical church. There you go. So, I mean... So who needed it? it exactly. So, but... Some things we haven't gotten better at. What, what he's, <laughs> but what he's not doing is another Facebook post that... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You attacking me now, Dave? What's that? You attacking me now, Dave? Is that the no? I'm sorry. No, not at all. Because, <laughs> because your, uh, no, no, no. We're not going. We're not going there. We're not going there. We're not going there. Uh, we're not going there. How to do play Facebook? Because I am just not that kind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, which is why I just don't. Yeah. You know. So, so. My my question is: Is, is there something that we should be doing? To actively, you know, uh, propagate this. But what it seems like Paul is doing is says there's there's really no, 
nothing you can do but be an example yourself? Uh, maybe. Maybe. So what I'm looking for is, is direction there as to how do you translate this into a Pauline biblical worldview look at how we address our our modern church. Yep. What is, how do we translate that into today? Yeah. So I'll I will give you what uh what I am trying to effort as our example in our class as the answer to that question. And it's on page 18 of your green book. 18. Right. We don't spend enough time with each other. We just don't. But I have as an occupation that I spend time with believers. Yep. And it ain't that way either. <laughs> so, uh, and that's where I'm struggling. It's like, this is... But you're not doing... And I'm not rebuking you here. Please don't take this as a rebuke. But this isn't what you're doing no, when no. you're spending time as believers, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. The more of this we do, the more of this we live. For the podcast, the green book was the this we do, yeah. and the Bible was the this we live, yeah. since the podcast people can't see that. So, sorry. All right. Okay, cool. All right, so I'll go back to my conclusion statement on page 68. We learn much about someone by how he treats his enemies. And I'm going to start saying that to myself in the mirror each day. All right, so... Uh, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So verse 19 is uh, a beautiful example of how Paul writes. So Paul will very often have some statement and then a clarification that can be outlined flawlessly. And this is why preachers love preaching Paul. Because you can put this in four points and boom, you're good. And boy, it just lines up nice and neat and it's fantastic. Um, so verse 19 is the first of his four points. Their end is destruction. Their end is destruction. Now, one of the tricky things about this is that there's not a verb in the Greek in that little phrase. So I don't have a, uh, a mood that I can rely on to say, is this subjunctive? Is this indic? It's just, these are just a bunch of nouns and pronouns that are strung together so this is just facts he's just he's just laying out facts for everybody here so my application here since paul begins at the end is uh their outcome is known their outcome is known like this is not this is not a questionable well i, I wonder what happens to people who are enemies of the cross of christ it's like no this is terrible this is absolutely terrible their outcome is known so what do we do with that? We'll believe and behave like it's true. I mean, that, to a certain sense, this empowers the believer to be clear about the gospel. It's, it's not like somebody who is lost. Now, this does not empower the believer to be obnoxious about the gospel, right? So let's make sure that we, we don't lose what we just learned on the mourn the enemies, not scorn the enemies. I did not mean for that to rhyme either. This is a terrible list of personalizations today. Sorry. Um, but this empowers us to just speak the truth, right? We, the, the beauty of Christianity is that we don't have to make anything up. Like, when we just say what is true about God and what he has done, it is a grand and glorious story. Like, we don't have to make anything up. You don't have to round up or make it pretty or sand off the edge. Just say what he's done. It's amazing. So let's... For us, believe and behave like that's true. If their outcome is known, well, let's engage accordingly. Right? And then application number two, their outcome is destruction. Their outcome is destruction. So what do we do with that? We mourn. We mourn for them, and we rejoice in our outcome.
We mourn for them and we rejoice in our outcome. You might say, Jim, that's a, that's a really weird personalization. Yeah, because if all we ever do is mourn, I'm not going to say we make a whole life out of doing nothing but mourning, right? There is a rejoicing element to the Christian life when we know what Christ has done for us. So that's the first one. Their end is destruction. Page 70. Their God is their stomach. Now, I am not a huge fan of capitalizing everything on the planet that could be related to God and all the pronouns. It just gets real complicated. It gets real confusing. There's several places in Scripture we just don't know. And you've got to make a pick, and this is really tr- tricky. But this is a really nice use of capitalization that the CSB does right here because the G there is a little g, right? Because we are, we are definitively not talking about Yahweh here. We are talking about the, the gods and the idols of the age. So their God is their stomach. So this is this focus on self-gratification, the me first, the consuming mentality. It's all about me. I'm going to feed myself and consume and I'm, what's best for me and I'm going to do me and my best life now and all this garbage that's just everywhere, right? So their application here, the big point here, is their God is themselves. Right? And we really, I mean, we, we fundamentally have two choices in our life. Okay? We can either acknowledge that I'm God or I'm not God. And I'm still going to go back to my favorite scene from the movie Rudy, where Rudy goes to the Catholic priest and he's talking about why he can't get into Notre Dame. And the priest is like, Rudy, I don't know what to tell you, but I've been, I've been doing this for decades and I've only come to two conclusions. There is a God, and I'm not him. And I'm like, that's a good place to start. But if after, you've been doing this for decades, and that's all you know, that's a lousy place to stop. <laughs> like, there ought to be a couple more things in the jar than that, buddy. But, you know, it, but their God is their stomach. It's just this consuming, consuming. So if their God is themselves, what do we do with that? Mourn and deny self and deny self. Does, does Jesus call us to, like, whatever you want to do for you to make you feel good? Like, just, no, not really. It's, actually, it, it's probably the exact opposite of that. <laughs> what, what can we do to deny ourselves so that Christ, when we tell his story, is accurate and he looks good? So, second, their God is their stomach. Third, their glory is in their shame. Their glory is in their shame. Now, this one, I will tell you, I, I went round and round and round and round trying to figure out what is he talking about here with this word shame until I went and looked at how this word is used elsewhere in Paul's writings. And then it was, oh, well, that's super simple. So if you got your, uh, or elsewhere in the New Testament, sorry. So Hebrews chapter 12 which way is Hebrews? Hebrews is after Paul's writings. There we go. If you guys knew how often I went to, this is the, like the logical structure of the New Testament, Gospels, Acts, Pauline writings, biggest to smallest, non-Pauline writings, biggest to smallest, end with re- uh, Revelation. Like, that's how the books of the New Testament are ordered in your Bible, if you knew this or not. Um, and since they're not really sure who wrote Hebrews, uh, they put it right after Paul which I think is saying quite a bit anyway, but you know, whatever. So this is Hebrews chapter 12. I'll start with verse 1. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. So I would circle back to your answer, or I'm going to interrupt whomever this is that's writing this. So this might be close to the answer that you were looking for earlier maybe. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Remember how we've talked about in class before that the cross was this, like you didn't even say the word in polite society. It was this, a bit of a, like, you don't, you don't talk about that. The, the, the stigma associated with that is so bad. We don't talk about it. It was shameful to be on a cross. And he didn't glory in the shame. He despised the shame. 
We shouldn't live lives that glory in shame. We should live lives that actually despise shame, even when what we are called to do may be something that is, in the eyes of the world, perceived as shameful. Does that make sense? So Christ is called to die on a cross for the sins of the world. At that time in culture, cross-typed deaths were shameful. Even though it was shameful, it was the right thing for him to do. But he didn't glory in the element of shamefulness. So when we look at what the Philippians' enemies are doing here, what the cross of Christ enemies are doing here, they glory in the shame. So we have an example in Christ to do the exact opposite. We don't glory in the shame. We, the exact opposite. So application at the bottom of page 71, their glory is in sin. Glory is in shame. So what do we do with that? Mourn. And then when we have sin or shame, we repent of that sin. Or we despise that shame. Does that make sense? That came out more convoluted than I intended it to, but did it not make sense? Oh, it, it made sense. Okay. Is that despising our emotion? Or no, 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 no. Uh, well, I don't know that I'd say it like that because I'm not sure that's how Hebrews says it. Hebrews just says despising the shame. It doesn't, it doesn't associate it with the person. It's the shame associated with the action that we are called to go through. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Well, there's a, there's a sense of the shame that the world puts on us. There you go. Right that's right. I think, we yes. We the shame that they put on us because if we're doing the right thing, we're not ashamed. And if there is cultural shame associated with it, okay, then yeah. there's that. Perfect. Yeah, that was good, brother. Thank you. <laughs> you dug me out of that hole. I appreciate that. Awesome. All right. Fourth thing. So first was uh, their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, and then the fourth, they are focused on earthly things. I don't know if you've ever read the screw tape letters. Uh, I try to read it every four or five years just as a reminder to, oh yeah, here's some of the ways that we're at least aware of how the devil is distracting and, fo and a great big chunk of the screw tape letters is just about, hey, look at this over here. Don't be focused on this and keeping our eyes on Christ. Uh, but this is, they're focused on earthly things. There, there is, like, there's not a lot of complicated grammar here. The focused word is present active participle. So this is their habit. This is their normal lifestyle. This is the typical, every, this is not a, oh man, I got distracted for two minutes there. Ugh. No, this is a lifestyle of focusing on earthly things, right? Like that's, that's what you are known by. So let me ask you this. Have you ever been, have we ever been, or do we know somebody who is consumed with earthly things? Yes. I don't even have to ask about anybody else. Like, have I ever been consumed? Yes, absolutely have. So they're focused on earthly things. So application there at the bottom of page 72, their, their focus is here, right? Their focus is here. And there's an element to which we should be aware of what is going on around us, right? We, we, I pray often to have the eyes of Christ, to see things as Christ would see them and to engage and to be the hands and feet of Christ and to serve as we should. But that's not what this is about. This is about their focus is here for consuming for themselves, right? This is the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have this stuff, I'm going to create a life that, is, that serves me, that fills my belly up. So what do we do with that? Well, I'd say we mourn, and we look up. Because that's exactly where Paul's about to go in verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's right. So, Next week, Lord willing, I will not be teaching on verse 20. Next week, is it okay I say it? Lord willing, 
Josh is going to be teaching on verse 20. (laughs) I am super pumped and excited. Uh, And we're even going to go hang out at El Matate one day this week and talk about Philippians. So, yeah. (laughs) Booyah. With cheese dip, baby. All right. Good deal. (laughs) So I'm going to focus on earthly things for that moment. And then we're going to talk about Jesus. All right. So, So there's that. It won't be a present active participle. All right, so that's the lesson for today. Thank you guys for engaging. Um, this was, th- there's, there's like three or four weeks in Philippians that are heavy texts with lots of like, ugh, I thought Philippians was about rejoicing. Well, this is one of the last ones. There's, there's one for sure more in chapter four, and it, there may be another one. I hadn't done the study on it yet, but um, we'll get back to like, Jesus is amazing next week so i'm excited about that yes ma'am sometimes you can't rejoice until after the morning yes i would say that's true amen 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 all right so you should have your weekly updates on your table uh so if you would lean in engage pray with those pray over those uh that we have had a lot of little changes to these over the last few weeks. So if you wouldn't mind just giving it a read through on all the prayer requests to make sure if there's an update that we can get those updated as well. Uh, and then after you have prayed as a table, you are free to go to worship this one who is our example in his end, his God, what to do with shame, and where his focus was. So... What a savior we have. Thanks, guys. Thanks for engaging. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, and weekly email. You can subscribe to all three of those at OurSundaySchool.com. Grace and peace to you.